are uh, in the process. We've just launched our new Life Hubs last week. Uh, so we had ours, we hosted ours on a Wednesday night. There's a couple on a Thursday, ladies group on a Saturday, uh, and our, obviously our young adult crew on a Sunday. Um, but it was great. We just had, we had, I think we had about 17 or 18 adults, about 10 kids in our house, and, uh, and lots of amazing food. I do love a bring and share. Yeah. So that's it. I was eating, I was eating, well, I didn't, I, I was actually quite busy during the day, I didn't get a chance to eat lunch, but then I, when I got home to take my son, Mike, to parkour, and I was like heating up these beautiful uh, prawn and pork spring rolls that were left over, they were good, hey? Yeah, everyone's like, oh, go on, the Kunana life up, that's it. Um, but uh, I, do, I do figure that um, we, we're talking about the rhythm of fasting as well, because we'll need that just to maintain our, our BMIs. And all that sort of stuff, but uh, but it was it was wonderful. Uh, so our life hubs are, are are a place where we get to do family in a smaller context than this. We love family. We try to do family in everything that we do, uh, but it's hard to connect and to connect deeply uh, in this kind of group, you know, such a large group of people. And so uh, Life Hubs are where we do family together. It's where we do discipleship, pastoral care, all of that sort of stuff. We want to release to the community uh, for us to do that together. And also as part of that, even in smaller groups, we have what we call DNA groups, so discipleship, nurture, accountability. There is information back on the uh, info desk there. So that's kind of groups like three to five guys or girls who get together to go even deeper in that uh, discipleship journey with Jesus. So what we want to see in this community and in every church community is... Uh, disciples making disciples and coming into maturity. So you'll notice on the wall, one of our four pillars is making and maturing disciples of Jesus. So you're not just getting people saved and then hoping they stick around till, till they die. Um, we actually want to see people become disciples of Jesus. So that means you're not just receiving salvation, but you're actually entering into the process of working out your salvation with fear and trembling, as the Apostle Paul says, and then coming into that place of maturity. And part of maturing is that then we go out and make more disciples of others. It is a foundational key of our journey with Jesus is discipleship. It's why he gave it to us as the Great Commission. Uh, and it is a commission. It's a partnering with the Holy Spirit to see people come and be transformed, to come into the reality of his kingdom. So I want to talk to you this morning about uh, we're, we're stepping into practicing the way. So that's at, at our next Life Hub gatherings in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, we will be uh, working through the eight-week course uh, from John Mark Comer and his team. It's called Practicing the Way. And essentially, these are spiritual disciplines. Uh, they're the ways of Jesus. And when we apply those ways to our life, then we see the fruit that Jesus got to experience in his life. So essentially, it's laying a foundation for our discipleship journey. And the reason why we, we chose to, uh, to kind of utilize this tool, but also to, to do it through our life hubs, is because we want to see everyone doing that. Uh, so if you're not in a life hub, I want to encourage you to get into and join up with a life hub. This is not because we're trying to like spruik life hubs and there's some, you know, sort of life hub challenge where we need to get it. As a leadership, as our family pastor, we're like, hey, this is a, this is a really beneficial thing for, for you. Uh, to do. Um, I, I don't host a Life Hub at my house uh, because it's beneficial for me. I don't have to go out on a Wednesday night, but, it, but that's, you know, one small bonus. Like, I'm doing it because oh, it's, it's beneficial for other people. So the reason why we're doing this is it's going to lay a foundation that you can build your life upon. It's a laying a foundation for your discipleship journey, or it's equipping you to help other people to lay a foundation. We don't want to create an environment where we are dependent upon people or upon systems or structures to come into a place of maturity. We want to see a people that actually, as, as those foundation stones are laid in your life, that you yourself take responsibility for your discipleship journey. Now, we need community around us to help to point out the things that maybe we're not seeing, but if we're sitting around just waiting, kind of passively waiting until someone else gives me an instruction as to what I'm supposed to do, that's not the way of Jesus. We are called to be spirit-led people. Paul says in the book of Romans, those who are led by the Spirit are called the children of God. So we are children of God, which means we need to be led by the Spirit. But in order to be led by the Spirit effectively, having some foundational tools in our life that help us to tune into God, help us to live in a rhythm of discipleship with Him, and also help to confront us of to where we're not living in that way is really beneficial. So 
We want to see a church where, where you're not dependent on us, on a leadership team to disciple you. We're discipling one another and we're all coming into maturity together. And then we're seeing that multiply and expand as more people in our city and our region meet Jesus than they need people to disciple you. If you're sitting here this morning and you feel like, I could never disciple someone, I bind that lie and I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Because <laughs> if you can't, then there is something lacking in Christ, not in you. Okay? Is there anything lacking in Jesus? No. So then there's something out of alignment with your thought pattern that says, I couldn't do that. You are called, you are commanded by Jesus to do it. So if it feels like, that feels like it's a, there's a barrier to overcome, awesome. Welcome to community and people who can help you to overcome those barriers. I, 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 I find myself oftentimes, like when people come to me with excuses, I'm quite good at finding ways to overcome excuses. So if you come to me with an excuse as to why you can't do something, I will probably find a way that you can overcome that to do it. So yeah, if you want to stay passive and stuck, don't talk to me. <laughs> on our discipleship or our Christian journey, we can often end up focusing on understanding and not on behavior. Now, we don't want behavior that lacks understanding. We want to be walking in wisdom. But in our modern age, particularly in the last couple of hundred years and, and with the age of enlightenment, we put this high value on knowledge. It's like knowing all of the right stuff. As I shared a couple of months ago, we are in a generation that has access to the most information that has ever been available at any time in history. Even the data on the internet is like doubling every couple of days, the amount of information that's accessible. And yet, if you look at the church, you look at the maturity of the church in the West, you might say, it doesn't seem like it's exponentially increasing in maturity. But I think because we've actually fallen in love with understanding, we've fallen in love with thinking the right stuff and knowing all the right stuff, and we've lost this uh, natural pathway of application. And actually having that become our behavior where we start to become like Jesus and then we live like Jesus. And to me, that's how the world is going to be transformed is as thousands and millions and then billions of little Jesuses are scattered out into the world. And I'm also aware that it's the most frightening thing to the enemy, to the kingdom of darkness, is a church that is awake, that is making disciples and sending them out onto the mission field. So it's okay if there's opposition. It's okay if you feel some pressure of opposition. It's just the kingdom of darkness hating you, um, but it's Jesus loving you uh, and the world. So. so Jesus invites us not just to know what is right, but then to actually do what is right. He says in the scriptures, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So if we say, I love you, Jesus, and I'm not obeying your commands, then there's something wrong in my understanding of what love looks like. So I need to rethink, okay, if loving you looks like obeying what you say, then it's really important that I'm intentionally pursuing obedience to your commands. In the Great Commission, it ends with, and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Again, it's not teach them the principles, teach them the ideas. Have lots of Bible studies where you all sit around and you know the Greek you know, background and you can quote this and quote that. If you're not living it... I mean, Jesus says, if you hear my words and you build your life upon it, you're a wise builder. If you hear my words and you don't build your life upon my words, then you're a foolish builder. And ultimately, whatever you build is going to get wiped out by some life circumstance that comes about. Essentially, to know and not obey is worse than knowing. You're actually better off to be ignorant than to be aware and to be disobedient. And that's why I encourage people, it's like if you're coming to the Bible and you're reading the Bible, you're studying the Scriptures, it's a really valuable, important thing to do, but come with a posture of an expectation is there will be something that I might read that's going to call me to obey. And if I'm not then choosing obedience, I'm actually more foolish than before I came to that Scripture. As I've said before, sitting in a garage won't make you a car in the same way that sitting in a church service won't make you a Christian. Uh, you've got to do different things. We've got to live in different ways. We, it's important to have understanding. Romans 12 is renewing the mind, absolutely. We need our internal world transformed by the Holy Spirit. That's why we're all about heart transformation. But it should lead to the unto of actually living differently, <laughs> behaving differently in the world. And as we talk about these spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices or spiritual rhythms, I use all of those words interchangeably. They all mean the same thing. But doing them or acting like Jesus also isn't the goal. 
In doing the works of Jesus, we are shaped into his likeness. So we learn a new way of living. So we could, be, we could per- perfectly fulfill all of the commands of Jesus and yet not fulfill the intent behind the commands of Jesus. In the same way that even the apostle Sp- Paul speaks of himself, like I, I did, I fulfilled the law. I did all of these things. And yet those actions without a knowing of Jesus were like refuse. They've become like refuse to me in comparison to knowing Christ. So to understand that the disciplines are there to draw us into intimacy. They're there to draw us and to confront us of where we are out of alignment with Jesus and his heart in order that we might be transformed and to walk in new ways of life. So it's really important that we don't start to look at spiritual disciplines or the practices as a, as a tick box kind of performance driven thing. It will wear you out. Even the whole of the Old Testament law is spoken of being uh, uh, like a, a shield around the people of God to keep them dependent upon God. So the law was like a guardian, the Apostle Paul speaks about. So we can, they, the, the, the Jewish people looked at the law and they thought, that is like ultimate life. If I nail the law, it doesn't mean that I'm going to go to heaven one day. I'm, I'm already a, a person, I already belong to God's family. But to fulfill the law is to like live that perfect way, to hit a, like a bullseye on a target. So again, these disciplines, they're not there to tick the box and then God will be happy with me if I'm praying enough or if I'm reading my Bible enough or if I'm fasting long enough. It's not going to change any of those things. What it's going to do is going to help you to enter into life in God's kingdom, to experience the fullness of him, to live in intimacy, and then to help others to experience the same. You may look at this stuff and you go, ah, like Bible reading, prayer, all that. They're all kind of the basics, aren't they? Like, why are we going back to the basics? Uh, One reason is I think many people have missed the basics. As I talk to people, I know for myself, I, I became a Christian at 16, and, uh, and I was very quickly, and, and uh, I'm not saying this is wisdom, but kind of thrust into a ministry context, in youth ministry. So I was finding my identity, I was, I was performing really well, and I was getting all of this affirmation that my heart was longing for. So it just drove me to perform more and to do more and to be that person. You know, I'd come first and I'd stay late and I'd do all of that sort of stuff, spending as much time as possible doing these things because I love the affirmation that it gave me. But I missed a lot of these foundational kind of discipleship principles. I missed these foundation stones in my life. So still today, like I'm looking forward to doing practicing the way because I feel like there's going to be some insight even for me. I haven't been following Jesus long enough to know everything and to be doing everything that Jesus calls me to. So it's it's going to be beneficial for those who have kind of missed some of those kind of basic frameworks for living with Jesus. For some of us, it might be that we've learned them and we know them and yet we're not doing them. So this is great because now it's in community, we will be practicing the ways of Jesus. Not nailing at first time the ways of Jesus, not perfecting the ways of Jesus, it's practicing. My daughter, is, she loves dancing and doing gymnastics. And sometimes she's like, oh, dad, I just, I can't, I can't do this thing. And she could do the splits, she could bend backs and all this sort of stuff that I certainly can't do. But she's always in that place of like, oh, I just want to do this next thing. I'm like, we well, just got to keep practicing. And as you practice, then it becomes a natural part of it. So now she's like, she said to me the other day, that I can just straight away in the morning, just go and do the splits. I'm like, hallelujah, no warm-ups. And it's like, that's great, but that came out of practice. And now it's a habit. Now there's an ease to it. And I think it shouldn't be that the disciplines or the, these kind of spiritual practices are always going to be hard, but they might be hard for a season. And that's why we need others to come around us and support us on that journey until we discover hey, this is actually okay and it's going to be okay or I can do this. Or maybe to say, there's actually something in my heart. Maybe there's a determination that I've made that's not allowing me to enter in and do what I want to do. So in prayer ministry, this is what we talk about. It's called a double bind. So what I desire to do, I've already determined not to do. And yet I'm unaware of that determination because maybe that determination happened when I was a child. I don't remember that thing. Maybe it happened in a way. It wasn't like I said the words, 
but maybe somewhere along the lines, it's like, I really want to trust God, and yet something in my heart doesn't allow me to trust God. Well, now that's the work you need to do with the Holy Spirit to get down to say, why does my heart not trust God? And that's why we offer and encourage you to have prayer ministry. So you may have missed these basic foundational rhythms. You may have learned them, but you're not actively doing them. Or you might be in a position where you are nailing it, and now you can learn, how can I teach other people to do it? So if I don't know it, I'm ignorant of these things. If I'm aware but not doing, I'm walking in disobedience to these things. Or I'm like, I need to be equipped to help other people to be obedient to Jesus. So that to me looks like three categories of people. That pretty much covers every single one of you. Hence the removing of excuses that I mentioned earlier. You you can creatively come up with a new one and you can come and talk to me later. Again, I'm not trying to push you. If you're like, I'm just not feeling led, bless you. You're responsible for your own journey with Jesus. But uh, I just want to encourage you, like as as a spiritual father, my heart is for you, that you would come into a fuller measure of relationship with Jesus and expression of him in the world. Amen. So building in spiritual formation rhythms or practices lays a foundation for our journey with Jesus. And I think one of the dangers of modern Christianity, especially the more charismatic end of it, is that we've become more familiar with encounter than endurance. We want the quick fix rather than the slow burn. Jesus wants the right outcome, and sometimes he'll do stuff in a miraculous moment, but oftentimes it's actually the endurance that it requires to stick with it until you see the outcome. That's the slow burn. You're like, oh, just throw me in the fire, Jesus. Burn it all off in one go. And he's like, I would, but there might be just a charred mess left over, you know? <laughs> so that's just how God works, and God's okay with that. I'm not sure if you've ever been in a, in a place where you've discovered it's been revealed to you, some sin that you didn't even know was a sin, or, or maybe a way that you were behaving around people, and like finally someone has the guts to kind of confront you and say, you know, when you do this, you're a bit... You know, maybe you're super sarcastic and it's actually hurting people and, and you were completely unaware of it. But that shock of like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that was a, a problem or an issue or something that I was doing. And then that, that shame can creep in to be like, oh my, how long has it been like this for? And has everyone known? And, and the reality is probably everyone's just loved you as you are. And it's the same thing with God. It's like God's just loved you as you are. He sees all of your brokenness. He sees all of your mess. He sees all of your dysfunction. He sees everything done in public and in private. And God loves you with an abundant love. He is a good father towards you. His grace is sufficient for you in your weakness. His mercy is abundant. And even still, when you're in a bad place, the throne room is open, as the book of Hebrews says, for you to come boldly before the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in your time of need. Amen. That's a good God. We're in a good place with God. Amen. But there are times where it's like God's like, hey, I want you to go and step into a new thing. Jesus even says, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness. Go after righteousness. Don't wait for someone or for God to confront you of your unrighteousness, but to go. It's not about getting out of the bad field and then sitting on the fence. It's actually stepping into the new ways of the kingdom and excelling and going after those amazing experiences with God, deepening in righteousness, getting rid of stuff. So it's not like, ah, there's some sin, doesn't really affect anyone. It affects you and your relationship with Jesus. That's the most important thing. And oftentimes our sin where we think it doesn't affect people actually has a huge effect. We're just not aware of it because it's not affecting us. And maybe that selfishness is actually the greatest sin anyway, so... So when we build upon each of these rhythms or practices, we get to taste a different way of living. They're like doorways that help us to access the ways of the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is a totally different way of living where more than likely we've been shaped to live as the world has told us to live. So to live in the kingdom means to live in a different way, which means to live with different habits and practices and principles. Amen? So I've got a, um, a rudimentary drawing, not a drawing, it's pictures that I found, of some of these foundation stones. And I wanted to just give a, a little bit of a, some of the things that can come out and be a fruit in our life when we start to build our lives upon these foundation stones. You got on there, Micah? There's a row. There we go. Can you read it? So these principles in the Practicing the Way framework are Sabbath, Prayer, 
fasting, solitude, scripture, community, service, generosity, and witness. Really important to understand that these practices, they're not magical, they're not transformative in and of themselves. You can do all of these things and not necessarily see the outcome of change in your life. The Holy Spirit is the one who does the transformation. Jesus is the one that we are focusing on in this. It's not that we're trying to now be good at Scripture. It's like, no, I want to be deeper in my intimacy with Jesus. I want to grow in my relationship with him. I want to become more like him. And I'm just using these things as tools. So it's the Holy Spirit who does the change. But the practices help to position us to hear from God. The practices help us to experience new ways of living and be confronted where our heart and our character isn't aligned with Jesus' heart and his character. So oftentimes it's like, yes, well, I tried prayer. It was really, really hard. I kept getting distracted, so I kind of gave up. If that was your journey, try it again and go, and now why am I getting distracted? Where's my ability to endure, to see this through, to form it as a new habit? Why is it so difficult for me to kind of shut off from everything that's happening around me? That's the point of the practice. It's not so that you can be really good at it. It's so it can even just reveal in your own heart, why do I not want to do this? Fasting. It's like, why do I not want to do this? Like, why does my love for food seem to be stronger than my love for Jesus? Which again, maybe you're not honest enough with yourself that if that's an issue, like we need to come to it and go, Jesus, you're really exposing my heart in this. Like I, I thought I was great at being generous and yet there's this opportunity where I'm practicing and I'm like, I, I don't want to do that and I don't want to be generous and I don't want to cost myself for other people. And so, okay, well, I'll skip that one. I'll just, eight's pretty good. Eight out of nine, you know, that's how many it is, you know. It's to go, no, oh, okay, wow, there's, there's something that's out of alignment in my heart, Jesus. That's not your heart. Your heart is abundant generosity, and my heart is very, very limited generosity. Well, I don't want to keep my heart. I want your heart, Lord. So now reveal in me what it is that's limiting my ability to be generous. Do you see how they work? They are as much encouraging into new ways, but also exposing old ways and ways that are patterned maybe after the world. So this is, again, where the role of inner healing and deliverance comes into the journey. So the practices can reveal areas in our heart that are in opposition to the ways of Jesus. So if you find yourself struggling to implement a practice, it's important not to strive on one end or give up. Invite the Holy Spirit to reveal the blockage or the stuck place. So don't just grit your teeth and bear it, and I'm just going to smash myself in this discipline and push and push and push and strive, because what if somebody finds out that I'm not witnessing enough, or I'm not living in community enough, or I'm not reading enough of the Bible, and what are they going to think of me? It's none of that striving and performing stuff. But you also don't want to go, ah, this is a bit too hard, I'll give up. There's a middle road of saying, I'm trying Jesus, and I'm finding it really, really hard. Holy Spirit, would you reveal what is the blockage? What's the stuck place in me? What, what, what's the mountain that... I need you to help me to overcome in order for this to be a naturally formed part of my life. So it's not about ticking the box of completing a practice. The intention is to reveal you in order that God might heal you. Amen? The reality is discipleship to Jesus is a journey of regular repentance. It's coming into a new way of thinking, a new way of believing, a new way of living. That's what repentance is. It's a changing of your mindsets. It's a shifting of your paradigms. And I think when we only put repentance in the box of like really bad sin, I've got to go and confess and repent for that thing, then it can have a, a negative connotation to it. Whereas repentance is a joyful gift from God. What a precious gift that he would give me the ability to see where my thinking is out of alignment with his thinking, where my ways are out of alignment with his ways, where my heart's desires are out of alignment with his heart's desires. Then I get the gift of repentance, like you allow me to change. I'm not stuck on that railroad heading towards destruction and unhealthy things. That the gift of repentance means, wow, we get to do a different path, Jesus, that you've laid out for me. So I, I encourage you that we should probably expect that we might find in implementing at least one of these is it's going to be challenging. But you will discover the hidden goal that Jesus has for you in it. You'll discover a deeper depth of relationship. 
even doing this last 28 day, the Daniel fast that we did in July, it was, it was tough. I assumed it would be easier than what it was. Because like, oh, I can eat potatoes and, you know, and sweet potato, I'll make my own chips at home. And, so, you know, it's like, oh, it's not too bad. And, and then, man, first week, I was like, I was, I was depressed, <laughs> to tell you the truth. It was like tough. And then it's like, I can't stomach any more sweet potato. I almost said a bad word then. It was like, you know, it's like, it's just, I just, and then I, and I got to a point, it's like, I just can't be bothered eating. It's like, why would I eat if it's just like, oh, might as well just done a full fast. It's like, it would be better than like falafel <laughs> and hummus and things like that. But you know, it like, it, it, it just reveals stuff. But I knew, I was like, I know there's a greater thing on the other side of this, Jesus. I know there is a gift for me as I, as I give my yes to you in this process. And so to see it out and to endure in that thing. And that's, that's the longing. It's like when it gets hard, there's a greater reward on the other side of it. So when we come up against opposition that we cannot overcome on our own, it's important that we, help, uh, that we seek help to deal with the opposition. Through, it's through support from others. Just that accountability, like, hey, I just need me. I'm just really struggling today. I need some accountability. I need some support. I need some encouragement. That's really good. Just through prayer, your own prayer, the prayers of others. But sometimes it actually takes inner healing or deliverance to help us to overcome. It's not just, oh, yeah, I'm just going to spend time. If I do this enough, and that's often what happens with habits, is if we do them enough, they become natural to us. But sometimes you could do it over and over and over again, and it'll never have breakthrough because there's actually something in your heart that's blocking it. Or there's a spiritual oppression that's happening that requires deliverance, that requires that thing to be smashed. Amen? So here are a few of the benefits that we can expect to see in our lives when we put the practices into practice in our lives. So as we look at each of these kind of foundation stones, and these are just a few of the fruits that can come from it in your life. But as we look at Sabbath rest, when we build our lives upon the practice or we build our habits upon the practice of Sabbath rest, this, we can have a deepening dependency on God. It naturally creates a deepening dependency on God because now it's not all about my works and what I need to do. It's actually about God's works and what he desires for me to do. And if it was okay for God to rest on the seventh day, then it's okay for me to have a day of rest. For someone like me, I, I love working, I love producing, I love creating, um, and I, I'm, I'm okay to rest, but sometimes I used to find on my Saturdays, like that's my like, one day where I can get all of those things done that have been kind of piling up on my to-do list during the week. And so it's maybe six months ago, and it's, as I've journeyed and kind of gotten old, I'm like, my body can't sustain that way of living anyway. But to take my Saturday and just to Sabbath and be with family, it's like, man, it's become such a joy and a delight that I look forward to. I look forward to not having an agenda and not having a schedule. And look, if I, if I get to the point of, oh, yeah, I, I, I'll do that. But I'm like, I don't try not to block anything into that day. And that's come, it's gone the opposite now where I'm like, no, no, I I'm, I'm protect that day. I protect that day of rest. I protect that day. I was like, because even just to have something on my calendar produces like a measure of like, okay, I've got to be prepared and it's like, it's coming and I'm like, I know if I'm, if I'm tired but I'm going to have to do it because I've already made that commitment where I just try not to, to do that. I try to set apart that time and it's been really, really fruitful. So it does help to relieve, reveal and relieve anxiety. Maybe it'll just reveal it in you like, I've got, I've, I can't stop, I've got to be doing stuff and I'm getting anxious because I'm not doing stuff, I'm not completing things and what's going to happen with that? That's part of that process is sometimes you go, it's only when I stop that I reveal how much anxiety I'm in. So the answer is we'll never stop. And I say, good luck with that. Because the outcome is burnout. And I've been very, very close to that in my life. Not, and not doing bad things, doing good things. But when good things become God things, then they become idols and we end up falling into a pattern of worship and that which we idolize, we eventually demonize and we will just go on that pathway of booming and busting over and over again. And it's not the way of Jesus. Jesus lived in rest. He didn't just take a whole lot of time out to do nothing. He took time out to be with the Father and that's what Sabbath rest is, being with God. It might be for you being in nature. It's just finding a place where you just come and just reset with God. 
and rest with him. It can reveal stuck places in us or opposition to God's ways. These are all good things that it might kind of produce, but it means then we live with less anxiety, greater dependency, in order with God's ways of living. That's some good fruit. Amen? When we, the next one is when we build our habits upon the practice of prayer, we become attuned to his voice. We start to learn his voice. We can go into deeper communion with him and intimacy with God. It creates a greater dependency on him. And it's like, well, I want to hear from you before I make a decision, Jesus. It, it informs our partnership with him. That's like a small grouping. I'm not saying this is all of the things. These are just some that I thought of the other day. But so it, it just helps to form that partnership. Like when I'm setting apart time just to be with him, to hear his voice, to share my heart with him, it's creating intimacy. It's creating this communion kind of relationships. It's increasing my dependency upon him that I get to do my day in partnership with God rather than just own my own, hoping that God's going to tell me if I'm out of order, rather than inquiring of him first. So when we build our habits upon the practices of fasting, we get to enter into a life of consecration, a life that is actually set apart where, where nothing is more important to me than Jesus. And that can be hard because oftentimes there's lots of important things and things that we value, but it's just putting into order Jesus first, the Father first, the Holy Spirit first. When we practice the habit of fasting, we can step into thankfulness. We're thankful for burgers and (laughs) deep fried things. Like we just produce this beautiful... No, I'm just joking. Um... But it does, like we start to appreciate that which we have and the abundance of provision, especially for us in the West, how much provision there is, how much access that we have to provision in our lives. And whether we're fasting from food, fasting from technology, fasting from whatever it is, but that practice helps us to break those habits. It confronts idolatry in our hearts. And it shifts us into a place where we learn that dependency on God for provision. It's like, I'm actually going to go without provision in this area to see you come and meet me. It can reveal idolatry of food. It can reveal idolatry of technology, of people, whatever it is. It just reveals and exposes that so that we get to come into a pure relationship with Jesus. When we build our lives upon the practice or the habit of solitude, We gain an ability to hear without the distraction from external and internal noise. I think solitude, yeah, literally one of the practices is to go and be alone. Now, obviously, you're alone with God, so you're never alone, but it's just getting out of the busyness, getting out of, even if it's relational busyness, like I... I know there's places in my world where I'm like, I need to go and find and be isolated. I could do it there. Like I could do prayer at home, but I find sometimes it's easier to go somewhere to pray. Oftentimes I'll go to and write my sermons off site because I get distracted by all of the wonderful people around here during the week. And it's like, I want to do stuff. Or I want to do this thing or that thing. And it's like actually stepping out into solitude helps us to quiet your heart and your mind in order that you can hear God. I do wonder whether sometimes maybe we we long to hear the voice of God and yet we don't create enough quiet to be able to hear his voice. Now, I know God can yell at us. I know we quote that scripture, the still small voice. I think God yells and God speaks softly. Um, But oftentimes it's, it's the busyness of our mind and our ability to tune in that actually doesn't allow us to hear from God. So that's a beautiful thing. Amen. All right, the next one, when we build our habits upon the practice of Scripture, so being immersed in Scripture, it renews our mind, so it shifts our ways of thinking about the world, about life, it fills us with truth. Now, we obviously, we have the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit in us, but when we come to the Scriptures, we find, what has God said before? And because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then God can speak those same things to us. We learn Jesus. When you read the Gospels, you you start to become familiar with who is he? Like, what what did he do? What does he invite us to do? What does he command? How did he relate to people? There's so much in the nature of Jesus because Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father's heart. Then we get to know the Father and the Holy Spirit through that process. 
They're just looking at his life, studying his life. And we learn the ways of the kingdom so that we can enter into eternal life today. Now, if that's a new concept for you, that whole idea of eternal life is not life that goes on forever when you die. Eternal life is the way of living that Jesus presents to us in the kingdom of God. And that starts today. Again, an issue, and I think a deception in the church is that we've been told, oh yes, you'll, you'll enter the kingdom one day when you go to heaven. But the kingdom of heaven is here. That was the whole premise that Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to earth. When he would speak to people, the kingdom of God was at hand. It was right. It was within your grasp because Jesus was there. But the invitation is today that we might get to experience the reality of the kingdom of God. But that comes when we need to learn the ways of the kingdom so that we act in alignment with the ways of the kingdom and the kingdom is produced in us and around us. A fruit of building our habits upon the practice of community. Who loves community? Yeah. Who loves solitude? Yeah, the extroverts and the introverts in the room. Woo-woo. Um, both are valuable. Um, so when we build our lives upon the practice of the, or the habit of community, we find uh, support and nurture in our journey. It's really good. We are not called to do this on our own. I would say, look, you can, but it's going to be really, really hard. We get to find accountability. Now, accountability isn't having people around you that point out all of the junk in your life. Accountability is people holding you to account for the ability that you, abilities that you have. All right? So it's actually finding the gold in you and drawing that out. I love having people around me that love me and that have wisdom, and they will confront me if I'm out of line, okay? in terms of if I'm doing something that's unhelpful. But I also know they'll confront me when I'm not in line with what Holy Spirit is calling me to do or with the identity of Christ in my life or where I'm not walking in the calling of God in my life. So we need people to point out, hey, that's a bit funky. And they need, we need people to point out, it's like, hey, you're being way too passive in that. Like, what are, you, what are you going after? Like, this is who you are. Do you not see who you are calling you forward and higher? We need that level of accountability too. Amen? It provides us with healthy confrontation. It's a good thing. Sometimes we need someone to point out when we've got something in our teeth. There are things that we just can't see about ourselves that we don't realize. But to live in community, and again, a loving, healthy, supportive community helps people say, hey, you might not notice this, but you kind of do some of these things, and it's not helpful, and it's not loving, and it's not kind, or whatever it is. It's a gift. It helps us to learn selflessness and the serving of others. And we get to learn that we are a body. We are not an island. We are not in isolation. We're not called to live that way. But we are the body of Christ. And we get to be different parts to one another. Amen? That is pretty good so far, do you think? Yeah. When we build our habits upon the practices of generosity, we discover the heart of God. Because God is a generous God. And you might say, oh, I guess I'll be generous when when it comes up. But actually, are you looking to be generous? Like, this is the thing with the practices. It's not where, well, if God convicts me, then I'll do it. That's passivity, not pursuit. Whereas God calls us to be be pursuers of him. So it's not saying, well, I'm going to practice a habit of generosity. I'm going to find opportunity in my week where I can be generous. I was just pondering yesterday, I was at Rockingham shopping center and I was walking I was considering to myself sometimes you know you might see someone who's in need and 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 often don't carry cash on me it's like you know I should probably do is at the start of every week just get some cash out of the bank and say and just have my generosity stash that's just there at any moment that I can be generous so that's forming a habit where I'm preparing myself that this week I am going to be generous no if someone hounds me for something okay I guess I'll I'll give something no I'm going to find opportunities for generosity is a very different way to live. We become stewards of his provision. Well, we don't say, okay, when there's a demand upon me, then I'll give, rather than going, no, no, you've apportioned generosity to me, so how can I then be a steward of everything that you've provided for me? We learn other-centeredness. Again, a really valuable thing. Our culture, we are in the world, we are continually affirmed to be selfish. You do you. You're valuable. 
You know, all of that sort of stuff is just absolutely opposite to the ways of the kingdom. We get to bless others, which is a blessing to us. When you walk in generosity, like you get to pour out and you see the impact that it has on other people. And so then you get to experience the blessing of that. And we're also then confronted of any idolatry of material possessions, which is very, very easy for us to do in the West where there is so much provision that we can just naturally slip into that place and we can go, well, I could have a new one of these or I could bless someone over here. But uh, well, no one's knocking on my door asking for money. I guess I'll just spend it on myself then. Whereas whose door am I knocking on in order to bless them? So I'm not even thinking about myself. And then I've discovered it's actually better to give than to receive. Hmm, sounds like the words of someone very wise. Jesus, yeah. See, there's a... That doesn't make sense in our mind. No, no. I love receiving. But there's something in that which is, no, it's better. So, okay, well, I want to discover your way. Because if you're saying it's better, well, I want the better way, not the worst way. When we build our habits upon the practice of witnessing, we get to fulfill the Great Commission. We actually get to obey what Jesus said, which is to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, again, it's not about just hitting the streets and bombarding people with Bible passages and getting them to pray a prayer. It's inviting them into relationship with Jesus. It's inviting them into a discipleship journey with him where they get to experience the kingdom of God. Now, the thing about all of these foundational habits is that if you help someone else, particularly a brand new Christian, to build their life upon these things, they're going to immediately enter in and start to experience the kingdom of God. Not experience Christian culture which sometimes can be unhelpful for experiencing the kingdom of God. Not getting them busy doing ministry and doing different things, but actually, hey, I want to help you to build your life upon these practices because as you do, you will essentially be building your life upon Jesus. When we build our habits upon the practice of witnessing, we help others to encounter Jesus. We get to partner with God in obedience. We get to see other people encounter the reality of the kingdom of heaven. That's a good thing. That others will get to experience what we have experienced. That we don't just hold on to that. We're like, I I want to and I need to give this stuff away because it is so good. Amen? Amen. So please, can I encourage you, if you are not able to be in a life hub, you don't want to be in a life hub for whatever reason, zero judgment here. It is something that we provide as a community for your benefit, but it's, it's no... You know, no worries if you don't feel to do that. Um, we even have, we have one up in Perth, so if you live further away. But you might find, hey, there's only one that's near me. It's too far to drive. I work on that night. All of that sort of stuff's understandable. Uh, if you can find a way, I would encourage you to do so because you will find benefit in that. But if not, can you please even just jump on and sign up to do the journey? You can jump on the Practicing the Way website. I was going to make up a screen that someone asked me to do, and I've forgotten, but it is, if you just look up practicingtheway.org, that's probably what it is, um, and then you'll find it, and you can just sign up, you can log in yourself, you can go through the process, you can set the dates, you'll get the reminder, and you can track with the community in your own time, and that sort of stuff, totally cool with that, um, but I just want to encourage you, it's in the context of community that your discipleship journey will thrive, so if, if you're not able to, to be, you can still join a life up even if you can't get to the gatherings. You can get yourself set up in a DNA, which would be really beneficial and helpful to you. But my heart is that you would see the fruitfulness of the kingdom growing and producing fruit in your life and that others then would receive the blessing of that by just being around you and being with you. Amen? Amen. Awesome. If you're able to stand, why don't you stand with me? I want to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, our desire is for you. And Jesus, if our, if our desire is not for you, Lord, we want our desire to be for you. That's why we're here, Lord. And Father, we thank you for these, these tools, Lord, these ways of living that you are helping us to establish in our lives that we know will produce good fruit for us and for others, Lord. So, Father, would you give us a joyful expectation, even knowing, hey, this might be tough at times, 
but I'm excited about what you're going to build on the other side. And I'm excited to have a firm and solid foundation for myself. I'm excited to learn this so that I can help others to have a firm and solid foundation as disciples of Jesus, that they might endure to the end, Lord. I've seen too many people start with Jesus and end without him, just drifting away. And Lord, what a, what a disaster, Lord, when people would not endure with you, Lord, not taste the ultimate fruit of being with you forever. But I'm also aware sometimes, Jesus, because we don't help people to build these things into their lives. We don't help them to become disciples. We get them through the door and then we just leave them to wander around the house on their own. But would you stir our hearts, Lord, to help people come into maturity, to help lay a healthy foundation for their future? And would you help us to learn these things? We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would give us endurance where we're lacking, Lord. That you would give us strength where we're weak. That you would give us insight and understanding where today, Lord, we're just ignorant. But we thank you, Father, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That you are working out all things for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So we thank you for this good way ahead, Lord. We thank you for abundant fruit and we thank you that you'll be with us, Holy Spirit, to reveal those places to transform our hearts, to change our lives, Lord. And that ultimately through pursuing you as disciples, Lord, we'll see this city transformed. We'll see this region transformed, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence, for your goodness, for your love. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name.